Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for this opportunity and every opportunity that you give us to just come together and just study your word, to feast upon it, to think about it, to meditate on it. We just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish but sealed to our hearts only truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle to the Philippians verse by verse and we're just now moving over into chapter 2. And just a casual reading of the uh, the first several verses of chapter 2 it shows me it, it's uh, unmistakably clear that the, the next five or six verses are just jam-packed with profound doctrinal truth. And I could spend a lot of time talking about doctrine and, and just how little Christians seem to be concerned about that nowadays. Because we t all tend to, to focus more on our feelings uh, rather than faith and uh, tradition rather than uh, true biblical doctrine just simply looking at the facts. I pointed out in, in a recent video, I think it was the last video, or it might have been the last or the one before that, and what I, I was talking about was God's choosing us and us not choosing Him and how unmistakably clear Jesus made it to His disciples that He chose them, they did not choose Him, and I, meant, I said, I think I mentioned in my video, if, if God did not choose you, you don't have a chance. And how that, that angers people and that leads to division, that leads to uh, adversity, which could possibly lead to division. Christians just don't want to hear that because they have been born into a religious ecclesiastical system which has planted in, in that idea into their mind that they chose God. It directly, just the direct opposite of what Scripture says. That we chose Him. That He didn't choose us. Or, well, see, I'll, I'll admit that Jesus did choose His disciples, but that was just a case in point. He was trying to, He was trying to, the Lord was just trying to, to get the point across that he had a specific, he was on a specific mission here and, and there was a specific goal in mind and, and in his pursuit of this goal he was going to, to do something unprecedented which is he was going to do the choosing but later on now that we're past Calvary, past Acts, now that we're into the year 2021 we're choosing God or that we have been for really all along. It's just that, or, or, or it's, it's a combination of both. God, God was not lying when he said that he really chose his disciples, but, and that they didn't choose him, but really they did. You know, they sort of did. They, they chose each other. And, and so, you know, but we make the scripture say what we want it to say because it fits the modern narrative and uh, you won't find that on this channel i'm gonna i'm gonna simply declare what the text says and and without claiming to understand fully what any verse is 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 really saying I mean, no man hand, has a handle on the truth. I can I can tell you what I think this particular verse is saying. One particular verse is saying that doesn't make it correct. That doesn't make it true. But what astounds me is the direct language that the Holy Spirit uses to often uses. He speaks so directly that it's impossible to take what he said as, as meaning something else. Well, I know that's what he said, but he really meant something else. 
and I can't do that. Now, another thing I want to point out before we get started here as we move into chapter two, I, I pointed out there's no chapter divisions in the original text. So it flows over from chapter one to chapter two. The Holy Spirit hasn't abandoned his thought, his thoughts about the last verse of chapter one, and he's or that he's starting on a new path of thought in verse one of chapter two. That's just not the way that works. There were no chapter divisions in the original text. So I wanted to point that out. I also want to point out before we get started that uh, because the next six or seven verses are so jam-packed full of doctrinal truth, and I'm talking about profound doctrinal truth, we could probably spend a year on the next six verses, the first six verses of chapter two, and not do it justice. I mean, that's just the truth of it. There's so much here that it, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the right word. It unnerves me a little bit. It, it sets me back on my heels a little bit. It causes me concern as to whether or not I can adequately deal with these next few verses, that I can do justice to these next few verses. So what I'd like to do is I like to do something a little different that I've, I'm not accustomed to doing. I have my phone here, and I'm going to go through this on the looking at the original text. I want to get a, a I want to I want us to get some somewhat of a of a taste for the original language and what these these words are saying in the original text as we go through these. Uh, these first few verses of chapter 2 in Philippians. Now, just to, here's a little background. I mean, as we came out of chapter 1, we were looking at belief and suffering being a gift from God. The word is grace, charisma. It's used there in the text as being, is making, making it absolutely clear that it was by grace. It was a gift of grace. Not only our belief, our faith, but that our suffering that goes along with that faith is also a gift from God. A great, it's graciously granted us to believe in Him, but not just believe in Him, but to suffer for His sake. And I pointed out, or at least I hope I pointed out, that you can't really have one without the other. If we really want to trust God, to be found tr trusting in Him, uh, exercising faith, toward God. I don't think that we can separate it from suffering. Uh, I don't think that we really truly understand or know or experience the full dynamic of faith or belief unless we're given something to test that faith or that belief, unless we're allowed to suffer. And both are, are a gift. I also pointed out how that I believe, and you don't have to agree with me, that our suffering for the sake of Christ is filling up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ, that he suffers along with us, and that our suffering is identical to his in a very specific sense. It would make no sense whatsoever for our suffering to be different, a different type of suffering than what he suffered. Okay. Another thing I want to point out to you is, is that we all should agree on the fact that one of the primary works of God in our life is his, his primary interest is, is in our growing in grace and knowledge of Christ, which has as its ultimate end uh, our being conformed to the image of Christ. So there's a conformity that's, that's occurring in the lives of believers. As, a, as we study his word, as God grants us faith, the ability to trust him, tests that faith and puts us through circumstances and difficult circumstances uh, in order to test that faith. Uh, many times circumstances which are very, very difficult to endure, but faithful God is. And, he, and he's after he's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. It's, 
I guess maybe what I'm trying, maybe I'm overworking the introduction here, but a little bit, but what I'm wanting you to see, what I want you to see in the next few verses of chapter two is something that is very, and, and I, it, I struggle to find the right words to, it's, these are deeply profound theological doctrinal truths that, as I said before, we could spend a whole lot of time on and not even really fully understand their import. I mean, we're only looking at the Word of God here. This is the Word of God Almighty, you know, creator of the heavens and the earth, who wrote this. If we begin in, in verse uh, 1 of chapter 2, uh, just reading from the, the English, uh, it's going to be different than the original text. I'm going to be reading from the actual interlinear, the Greek interlinear, the the NAS interlinear, but it's, it's as close to the original text as you could possibly get. If there is any, therefore, encouragement in Christ. You'll notice when you read the original text that the words are, are in a different order. You know, this, the, the words are placed in a specific order for emphasis. Uh, if there is any, therefore, encouragement in Christ. The word encouragement is where we get our word comforter. Uh, it's, it's, it's used of the Holy Spirit being our comforter who comes and walks alongside. It's, it's uh, para, uh, kaleo, kaleo, para, in, the, in this particular text, it's uh, para, uh, klesis, it's encouragement, comfort. Uh, if there is therefore any encouragement, and automatically our minds go to, well, maybe there will be and maybe there won't. And the, so the first thing I need to point out to you folks is that when we begin reading here in verse 1 of chapter 2, all of these ifs, uh, they're not what they seem to be. Since there is any, uh, therefore, encouragement in Christ, because there will be. Since any comfort of love, uh, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, affections and compassions, The text will, won't allow me to say that, well, maybe there, this is, there will be and maybe there won't. The text is clearly saying, since all these things be true, and we just left chapter 1, and if you followed us along in these studies, you know where we, we wound up at the end of, ch of chapter 1. Since all this be true, then... We are to fulfill, Paul says, fulfill my joy. And then we have a hint of clause, so that the same you may be minded, you may be minded, have the same mind, the same love, same mind, same love. Now, folks, Listen to me. We can we can just casually read through this in our whatever translation that we're using, whether it's the authorized version or even whether we're following it along in the, in the original Koine Greek. We can read this, and it's very easy to just simply take these words as being were to be of the same mind, same mind, same faith. Verse two, same mind, same faith. And simply just look at that as from an, uh, somewhat of an evangelistic mindset. Well, of course, we're of the same mind and same faith because we're preaching the same Jesus. Okay, that, that, that died on a cross, was buried, raised again on the third day, so that you can do something to become redeemed. We've got to caution ourselves about reading into the text our own doctrinal position rather than 
allowing the text to speak to us doctrinally where the, the, the verse itself, the words themselves, the text itself, the Holy Spirit's mess, the message that he intended to convey was one in, in which we are uh, of the same mind. We have the same mind and same, same love having. Same love toward one another, same mind. If we move over to, to verse 3, nothing according to self-interest or according to vain cons conceit, but in humility one another, esteeming one another as surpassing ourselves or themselves. Now, if I go back to the original text and read this just in the authorized version, uh, the King James, if I just read this in the King James, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And we know that the Christian life can pretty much be summed up by our minds being renewed, a renewal of the mind. It begins with repentance. That's a change of mind, but our minds are being renewed, okay, day by day. It's, it's this whole idea of, of, of our allowing nothing to come to be done through strife or vain glory, strife or vain glory. Uh, you know, when we talk about envy, strife, vainglory, we're looking at ops. we're looking at stuff that has no place in a system that stands outside, stands apart from that religious system of human merit, that world religious system, that ecclesiastical system of human merit. If we are truly standing before God as who we are, presenting our, our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, if we are truly interested in our lives being conformed to Scripture rather than than uh, taking Scripture and somehow forcing, t twisting, rearranging Scripture to fit our, our personal belief system on, on what we think the Christian life is. I guess the, the simple point I'm trying to make here that, that I see here in, in verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How do we do that? How do you look more to, to the needs of others, or at least look also to uh, on the things of others, the interests of others, the needs of others, not just your own? What, what would cause you to do that? My point is a simple one, folks. If we are so concentrated and so focused and so driven on trying to settle things between ourselves and God, we're not going to have a whole lot of interest in others. We're not going to have a lot of time for others. It's all because it's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about it's it has to do with vainglory. It has to do with envy and vainglory. It has to do with with. Uh, it's not a lowliness of mind. I, the reason I'm, I, I can have, be lowly in mind and think about others, uh, not just myself, is because, and, I, and I've got to be careful the way I say this, but it's because my needs, spiritual needs, are not that great a, a pressing concern. Okay? If, if, I, if I'm settled on the fact that I belong to him, that if I have the assurance 
of my own standing and my own position before God. All right. If if it's kind of like I'm okay, okay, you know, because I, I I understand who I am in Christ. I understand I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. I understand that I've been fully forgiven. I understand that I've been crucified with Christ, buried, raised with Christ, that I'm co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And I can go on and on and on and on about all of these doctrinal truths that most Christians don't really, at least today, it's been my experience, they don't really have a whole lot of fascination with these marvelous, grand, marvelous truths, these profound doctrinal truths. But if, if that's what I believe, I'm not going to be so self-centered. I'm not going to be so self-focused. I'm not going to be focused on me. I'm going to be focused more on others because I'm fine. Now, does that mean when I say I'm fine, does, am, I, am I saying that I don't need anything? No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is I'm, I've realized that I'm coming behind. I'm lacking in no spiritual grace. Now, Look not every man on his own things. So, well, what is what is the word for things? You know, it's it's uh, it's easy to read it into this just what we wanted to say. The, the word is they just translated it things, not the things of themselves. Each considering, so that. I guess the Lord's just left that open for us to just fill in the blank, write in whatever we, we think those things are. Or, you know, I mean, as, as if he, I've mentioned this before, it's like the, the, he didn't put a footnote down here, here at the bottom that says, okay, the things that, you know, and here they are, and he lists those things. But we can know from the context what these things are. Can I classify your need to make your car payment or let's say make your house payment? If not, you'll be out on the street and you won't have any place to live. Is that one of the things? Well, of course it is. I'm not going to try to separate the physical stuff from the spiritual stuff, but what I will suggest is that you can't talk about one without the other, about talking about the other. We, we can't take and separate our physical lives from our spiritual lives because the two are so intertwined. Not the things of themselves, each considering, but also the things of others. Folks, the only, only way that, that this could possibly pan out that we could possibly experience the reality of verse 4 in our lives is if we are first assured of our own confident position in Christ. And I believe that the Holy Spirit expects that, that this, is, this is to be expected. In verse 5, this let mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Now, now we are to, to this, is, this is a really interesting uh, discussion that the Holy Spirit is preparing us for here. Let this mind be in you, which also in Christ Jesus was. Same mind as him. And that right there ought to really set us back to thinking. The same mind. We have the mind of Christ, says Paul. We know that from, from other scriptures. So as we begin to look at this mind of Christ, I think that it's safe to at least suggest, I, I, think, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb to suggest that the Holy Spirit is wanting us, directing us into a thought, the thought, the mind of Christ, which ought to be our own mind, which pairs us up quite nicely with Christ who in the form of God in the form of God we got to stop right there the word morphe 
in the Greek. You know, typically that it, it means it just really means what it means. It means form. But there have been many, and especially nowadays, with the attacks on the deity of Christ. Well, see, this is what this this is saying is that he was just in the form of God. He wrote he really wasn't God. He set aside his deity when he became incarnate in human flesh. So, you know, it's and, and that's what the whole text is going to be point, saying to us. If, we'll, if, we'll, if you'll just read this carefully, who in the form of God existing, not something to be grasped, considered to be equal with God. Now, you and I both know. Uh, there's there's a couple of things we need to get down, set set down as fact before we go any further. Let's let's just stop for a moment and think about some of the the, the divine attributes of Christ. He's he's omnipotent, present. He's everywhere. He's he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's omniscient. He knows he knows everything. He's all knowledge. Okay. If you take one of those away. If you just say that he set aside his deity to become man and, and now he's no longer really fully God, I think we've done it, it, enormous damage to the text. That's, that's putting it mildly. Jesus, the, the text here, folks, is saying, and particularly those of you who are looking at this in the, in the original Greek language. It, it's, it would be impossible for you to come away from this saying anything other than the fact that what this is saying is that he was always God. Always God. He is God, and he always will be God. He's never going to be less than God. But he, he didn't consider this, and well, therefore, based upon that fact, he didn't consider it robbery to, to be to be equal with God. Now, you may you may be out there thinking, well, see, yeah, that's, that's kind of obvious. I mean, that's a big surprise there. It doesn't really impress me all that much. So he doesn't consider it to be uh, his deity to be you know robbery, uh, you know. Uh, isn't it, it and in the word it's interesting that the word and y'all some of y'all are going to love this <clears throat> that something to be grasped is is what the original word is in the greek it's it's harpagmon it's the re, it's from the root word harpazo to seize he christ the text is saying that he did not consider that equality with god that he did have Okay, because he's God of very God. That he did not consider that something to be seized upon. And I'm almost at a loss for words. <laughs> Folks, if I had been God, uh, you would have known it. Okay, I'm gonna make it a, I'm gonna go out of my way to make it a point to make sure that you know that I'm God Almighty, God Almighty in, in, in human flesh. I am I'm in, I am the exact representation of the Father. I am, I spoke the worlds into existence. I mean, I am God of very God. There's none, no God, no other God but me. I mean, I'm going to show you just how much I'm God. That's that's what I would do. But that's not what he did. That's the point I want to make. He didn't consider that something to be grasped, seized upon. Same word as harpazo. In fact, it's from the root harpazo. Well, it's no wonder. So he didn't, no wonder he didn't consider that to be a robbery because he's God, a very God. But he emptied himself. He emptied himself. Now the question becomes, what did he what did he empty himself of? Okay, see, see, there again. Okay, Jesus is, you know, and I've heard this, folks, I've heard this my whole life. 
He emptied himself. Well, what did he empty himself of? Hey, well, he, he emptied himself of his deity, is what I'm told. And of course, he didn't do that. We know he didn't do that. He emptied himself. Himself emptied. The form of a servant, the word is doulos, slave, okay? So he took the form of a slave, having taken in the likeness of men, having been made, okay? So you have the God-man, Jesus Christ. He's always been God. He is God. He always will be God. He, he's, he will never be anything less than God. But he didn't want to... The text makes it absolutely clear that the, 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 that the display of that, the full display of that deity, okay, was not his main interest. That's what it's saying. I believe that that's what the text is saying. I believe that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to see. We're looking at him being one thing and then, and then, and doing going the opposite extreme i mean we're we're looking at the god man jesus christ emptying himself and taking the form of a slave so he's a slave of god made in the likeness of men having been made in the likeness of men and in appearance having been found as a man he humbled himself god humbled himself and no wonder it shouldn't really we, we, it shouldn't amaze us that, that god is a jealous god that he guards his glory he humbles himself, having become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore also God him highly exalted and granted to him the name above every name. God him highly exalted. I, I'm going to suggest that, that you, you could live the most perfect life that you could ever possibly try to live. Just about do everything right. And uh, the question would be, would God exalt you? Would he exalt me? You know, for separating myself from the world and for, for living a, a, a upright Christian life and, and, you know, sort of dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and just doing everything right and God will exalt me because of that. And that is basically what modern Christianity believes, if not in their mind, in their heart. They won't say it oftentimes, they won't say it, but that is exactly what their theology demands. That's what it insists upon. There's only one reason a Christian will live his entire life under law, despising the grace of God. And that's because he believes that somehow he can earn points, merit, before God. That, that he can do something to somehow become acceptable to God. That Christ is really not our propitiation, God's satisfaction. Okay, God receiving satisfaction for a just pay payment for our sins. But it's, it's really not about that at all. It's about our living the right way where that God will then take and exalt us. And whether it's by verbally exalting us, you know, hey, Talking to the angels, you know, he's up there, he's talking to the angels. Oh boy, you ought to see oh, oh Steve how he's doing and and 
Steve's just doing great, man, and I'm just, I can't praise him enough. I don't know. Well, I shouldn't say I don't know. I, those thoughts, folks, to me, just border on, near, just border on blasphemy. All right. Uh, there has only been one person whom the father has ever said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He never said, Here's, this is Steve in whom, I, in whom I am, this is my beloved Steve in whom I am well pleased. Never, never said that. And for good reason. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that God is not pleased with me. I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is that God did not openly declare that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't say that about me. He only said that about Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is making it absolutely crystal clear that every name, every name, that he's, he's, he's exalted the name of Jesus Christ above every other name. I'm trying to point out, simply point out here how that the, the whole idea of who we are, the grace of God that we've seen in the first chapter of Philippians, the grace of God that continues over into the second chapter, the, the call for unity, to be of the same, have the same heart, same love, same mind for one another. None of that fits the modern legalistic uh, Christian narrative. Uh, not, not for new birth, and and especially not for new birth. But moreover, not as it pertains to our life and our walk in in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. I often wonder how many Christians come to realize who they are in Christ and abandon that theological belief system, that 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 doctrinal belief system. Uh, you know, they're standing hard and solid on the fact that God forgives them, God loves them, God's got with an undying love that He'll never do anything in your life except it be for your ultimate good, that he's forgiven you of all your trespasses. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. He knows the paths that you take when he's tested you. You shall come forth as gold. I could go on and on and on and on and on. And I wonder how many Christians there are who have come to solidly stand upon those, those vital truths, those positional truths concerning them, them, how they, how that God sees them, how that they stand before God, that they stand before Him, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, and yet abandon that, completely abandon that, that, that doctrinal position. How do you do that? How do you do that? I don't, I don't see how you can't. I don't see how you do. I don't see how you can't. I really don't think that you can. That's just my own personal belief. It's kind of like, well, if you never, if, if, if you abandon such truths, you never really truly believed in those truths to begin with. It's kind of like, you know, well, if, you know, the, the old story of, well, if you're not, if you're not truly saved, if you're not really redeemed, if you're not a true Christian, if, if, if you don't wind up in heaven, okay, it's, it's because you were never born again to begin with. It's not that you were born again and then you suddenly became unborn again by something that you did. God will never, ever exalt me for anything.
you know, I understand we're not going through the epistle to the Galatians. If we were, we this would be the the whole in, idea, the thought that the Holy Spirit would be driving us toward would be one of, of separating, making that clear distinction between law and grace as it, as it involves the body of Christ. And understand this is not the book of, of Galatians. Understand we're looking at Philippians. But Philippians, the reason, one of the reasons why this has become a favorite epistle of mine is because of the comfort that we derived from the doctrinal truths that are jam so jam-packed into Philippians. There's just no place, folks, for envy under grace. There's no place for strife un under grace. There's no place for vainglory under grace. Now, you turn that all around, okay, if, if, if you want to say that well, we're not under grace, we're under law, well, now all of a sudden, now you have a you have plenty of room for vain, self glory, uh, all of that junk, all that garbage, that carnal, fleshly garbage. But under grace, there's no place for it. There's no room for it. It doesn't fit anywhere. It's no no wonder we can be have the lo same love and concern and compassion and, 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 and you know feelings for one another. No wonder that we can have the same, be of the same mind, have the same heart, same love, same same same, because we're under grace, not law. It's not complicated, folks. It's really not as complicated as we want to make it out to be. We can spend a lot of time thinking about these verses. I'm already looking at, up, I'm up to verse 10. You know, not that that's where we are actually at in our study, but I, I've, I've run ahead to verse 10. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in the heavens and on earth and under the earth. Well, that's that's pretty you know, all that's pretty inclusive. In the heavens and on earth and under the earth, there's, in other words, there's no place that his name is not is not exalted. There's no name that there's no place that, that, that no one exists anywhere in which they could they they will not bow their knee. Uh, the, the question in my mind is always, and it has always been, how can Christians today simply pick up their Bible and look at it as a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life and miss seeing Christ altogether? As if Christ is just some sort of backdrop, background, okay? Uh, he's He started all this. He started something that he was gone, he's gone off and left us to continue in, on our own with. He, he's, 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 a, he's a part of it, all this, but in name only. It... It's, it's it's not really true that for, to me for to, to me to live is Christ. It's not really true that that as Paul said in Galatians, not I but Christ. That's that's not really true. Not really. Or if I if I read those words and I and I and I think about that, I think about how well, how lovely how lovely that those words are. That's not that's nice poetry. Uh, to me to live is Christ. That's it's beautiful poetry. And not I but Christ, Paul says. It's great poetry. Of course we all know that, you know, really that to me for to me to live is me. Right? I mean, you know, it's just the Holy Spirit is is spiced he spiced this all up with this wonderful poetry that that's really not to be ta taken so literally it just it's it's a it's a little pep talk 
here, you know, like you used to get in high school, you know, before, you know, a football game. I don't know how much time we actually sit around thinking about Christ, our life. Or Paul's favorite phrase, in Christ, in Christ. Okay. You know, there's a huge difference between with Christ, by Christ, for Christ, of Christ, and in Christ. It's an amazingly powerful little two-letter word, in. Okay? In Christ. How many Christians today sit around meditating on the, the dynamic, the powerful reality of our being in Christ in that doesn't mean just in the, in the general sphere of or in the area of like you're in the approximate vicinity of Christ folks you are in Christ you are in Jesus Christ you're in him okay in him No wonder we're, we're to, to be of the same mind, have the same mind, same heart, same love toward none, to care about the needs of others, not just the, the needs of, our, of ourselves, not just be concerned. And I believe that the text is primarily speaking of our spiritual needs, not that I'm trying to throw out all the rest, the physical needs. Those are just as important. I just don't, I don't think that you can separate the two. But I think that the mind of the Holy Spirit is his major concern, his major interest, his primary interest here is in pointing out that it is the, the spiritual needs of one another that we're to, to care about, not just our own spiritual needs. But how do we come to that point? How can we come to that point if we're still struggling with our own, trying to understand our own identity of who we are in Christ? Well, I know I'm in Christ, but I just don't quite understand all that. You know, I, I want to be in Christ. Uh, you know, it's, I think I've heard just about every possible angle of, of, of misdirection from that thought. Anything other than just believing that you're in Christ. Well, Steve, I don't know what it means to be in Christ. Uh, how, about, how about so closely identified with him that when he died, you died? And when he was buried, you were buried. And when he was raised from the dead, you were raised from the dead with Christ. That you've been co-seated with Christ in the heavens. How about that? How about being made a member of his body? A member of his body. Okay? We are members of the body of Christ. Members of the body. Honestly, folks, I don't think I can do justice to the first 10 verses or, or whatever of the second chapter of Philippians. I'm not going to go past verse 11, at least not in this video. Okay, uh, I just, I don't want to do that. I do know that the, the body of Christ is... is something I don't think that it's far more sacred a thing than, than we, we tend to, to even think about when we even use when we utter that phrase the body of Christ the body of Christ the body of Christ the church the body of Christ yeah it's it, we know that it's a living organism we know it's not a brick and mortar structure we know that we know that the body of Christ didn't it hasn't evolved okay I'll put that in quotes the, the body of Christ has not evolved into some religious institution. Okay? I, I'll t I'm going to tell you for a fact, that has not happened. I mean, though many of its members are either actively a part of it or, or they've been saved or delivered out of it. They've come out and they've become separate from it. In fact, it hasn't evolved, quote unquote, at all. The body of Christ. Okay? The body of Christ is just as what it what it is today is what it was at the very moment of its ince inception. It's its creation. Okay? The body of Christ. It hasn't changed. 
It hasn't evolved into some progressive. Oh, you know, it's it's yeah. You know, the body of Christ is progressive. You know, it's growing and it's it's coming more and more to understand. You know, no, it hasn't gotten better. In fact, I'll even venture to say it hasn't gotten worse. Has the flesh gotten worse? Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely clear from Scripture that the old man becomes more and more corrupt every, day by day while the new man, is, his mind is being renewed on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we know the flesh gets worse. We know that. But has the body of Christ gotten better since Acts? No, it hasn't. And we're not smarter, okay, than first century Christians were. There's been no new revelation given, okay? We are who we are. And it's and it's based upon on the, the ground of that of that fact of those that that evidence. We're grounded, we're so we are so grounded, okay, in the facts concerning our relationship with the Christ, one which is based upon grace, we are so grounded in that. At least from God's perspective. That it's when we talk about the body of Christ as a whole collectively, okay, not just in us individually, but collectively, the body of Christ as a whole. The church today is is alive and well. Okay, it's not. It's God is not doing a sloppy work or job as it concerns the body of Christ. We're members of His body. We're bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh, and since. By grace, you believe, you've been granted, it's been granted you as a gift to believe and suffer for his sake, to suffer in his place. Since we are one in Christ, okay, since we've all been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, since we all stand on the same solid ground, which is the merit of Christ, not our own personal merit, since that's true, since we are assured of our position in Christ, we don't find it complicated to have a concern for others. We're not because we're not coming behind in any spiritual grace. We're not lacking in any spiritual gift. No, I don't believe that God in the flesh fully displayed his deity. If he had, he would have scared the socks off everybody. He set that aside. He emptied himself of that. He became God's slave in human flesh. Humbling himself, even to the death of a cross even to the death of a cross. You know, there are so many Christians out there today, folks, who have so disassociated themselves from the cross of Christ. I'm not talking about, well, I, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ died on a cross, okay? Some 2,000 years ago or whatever. But now it was his cross, I mean, that's, and that's where the price was paid for my, you know, for my sin and all that. But that's as far as that goes. That's where it stops, okay? The cross has little to do with me. Unless I want to start talking about how, how much I have to, uh, to please God by my own self, my, my own, through my own efforts, human performance, okay, I need to somehow satisfy God and please, appease, I have to appease God by, by some acceptable degree of performance on my part. And so there, and therefore that's, that's me. That's, that's what it means. Me carrying my cross, me bearing my, my burden, my cross, my cross. Okay. Is to, 
is to, to do just what he did because he's the perfect invitation. He's the perfect example. And if I can just do what he did, then God will accept me the way that God accepted him and he'll exalt me as well as exalting him and uh, the fallen nature, the, the mind, the, the unrenewed part of our mind, folks, is insidiously wants to, to always in, inject into the conversation, insert into the conversation, some idea of human merit. We just, we can't resist, okay? It's got to be, there's got to be some degree of human merit involved in my walk, in my life, in my relationship with Christ, even though the text says there's none. None. You know, one of the things I've always found it, it's always amazed me is how that Christians, even and, and I'll even include myself. I mean, I, I cannot not include myself. But so I'm I'm not just trying to be critical here. I'm just but I I think the point needs to be made that we as Christians somehow believe that we can somehow do in the, with a fallen nature what Jesus Christ our Lord refused to do when he had a sinless nature, when he could not sin, and yet he refused that whole idea of, of he, that, he, that he came to. Now, don't get confused, all right? What Christ did was he came to do the will of the Father. It was the Father working through the Son, okay? Just as it is Christ working through us, not ourselves, the pattern is consistent there with that. And he completed the work that the Father gave him to do, and he said as much before he died. Now, wait a minute. He hasn't yet been crucified. He hasn't yet paid the penalty for my sins, and yet he's finished the work the Father gave him to do. Now, how, that just, how can that, that doesn't make sense. Unless the one thing that the Father could not do was do what the Son did. The Father couldn't die on the cross. The Father couldn't pay for our sin. He did finish the work the Father came, gave him to do, but the one thing that, that he had to do on his own, that he did do on his own, was die in your place. But we tend to think that we can somehow accomplish in the flesh, and we have that, we, we tend to somehow, I don't know where are, we muster up all that confidence in our flesh when we live with our flesh every day. And we know just how the, the flesh is. We somehow think that we can do in our own strength what Christ refused to do when he was the incarnate Son of God, God of very God, Incarnate in human flesh. And in his service for others, you know, it's it's easy to just look at Christ as being, you know, uh, he's just, well, uh, the Father sent him into the world, and that's that was about the, you know, the extent of it. Father left Christ on his own to work. That's not true. So we can't do with a with a sin nature what uh, our in our own strength what the the sinless, omnipotent, all knowing, all present Son of God refused to do. Wherefore God also hath exalted him, him, okay? He won't exalt you for trying to become like him. That's law. There's a better way, folks. There's only one one way, one thing that causes us to have the same mind, same love. We're talking about unity here. To be of the same mind, and that is where our affections are set on things above, not on things below. That's ourselves. That's law. That's the flesh. That's ourselves. But things above, 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The finished work of Christ. Folks, it is finished. It truly is finished. I think even Christians today are hesitant to admit because they somehow think that if they say it's finished as Christ and, and really talk about the meaning of those words when he said it is finished, I don't think he was just talking about his life being over, his physical life coming to an end. But the work that he came to do, you can't add anything to it. You can't improve upon it. You can't whitewash it and make it better. You can't add anything to the finished work of Christ. You can't do that. Well, listen, I, I've, I've got to go. I, I, this thing has run over, completely run over an hour. Uh, I, I apologize for any confusion that I may have left you today. We're going we're gonna to talk about this some more in, in the next uh, uh uh, next few video videos I want to I want to take a moment quick moment just to thank you so much for these videos don't get a lot of views but those of you who are viewing these videos I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because that is a great encouragement to me I want to thank you for your participation all the comments the kind warm comments that you send my way and I want to thank you for the supporting this ministry. It, it is having an impact in the lives of God's people. I know that. I see that every day. Rest in Him. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.